right, a couple of things I forgot to mention in announcements. Number one, make sure that you uh, greet our visitors after the service. If we're a small enough church that the visitor shows up, you don't sneak by. So make sure that you visit the you, <coughs> excuse me, you greet them after the services. And then also, uh, things you can pray for. Brother Elliot's not feeling well. And pray for me as well, because obviously, as you can see, I'm not feeling well. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, the title of the sermon this evening is going to be <clears throat> Understanding the Lord's Supper. Understanding the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to be preaching this evening on the subject of the Lord's Supper, or otherwise known as communion. Now, our church, as of yet, has not practiced or performed uh, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. We were established last year. 2018 in the month of March, <clears throat> and um, I'm going to get into the details of how often we think that we should be doing this as a notification to everyone that is a full-time church member here that comes here, and we'll be returning next Sunday evening. We are going to be taking part in the Lord's Supper, just to give you a heads up, and the, the purpose of the sermon this evening is to make sure that you walk out of here with a well-rounded understanding of of the Lord's Supper. It is a very, it is one of the, the most important um, um, practices as a church that we are given from our Lord as far as what takes place within the church here in the church grounds. And you will see <clears throat> that uh, emphasized or pronounced at the end of the chapter here in 1 Corinthians 11. And the great judgments and condemnations, which are not mentioned to this severity many times in the New Testament. But you see the, the severity of this uh, if someone were to just flippantly take the Lord's Supper and not take it serious or taking it lightly like the Bible would say. And I'm going to get into the judgments and everything at the very end. And that's one of the reasons why I'm preaching this particular sermon a week ahead of time is to give everyone uh, you know, substantial time to do a couple of things that need to be done prior to that. Now, I'm going to start this morning at a very rudimentary level. The kids are here so the kids can understand, so everyone understands. So uh, I, I don't mean to insult your intelligence in the way we begin, but we're going to pick up pace as we go. <clears throat> the Lord's Supper is a term that the Bible uses. So this is a biblical term. Now we're going to define every single word in that. We're going to look at other words in the very beginning, the introductory portion of the sermon, so that everyone completely understands what we are practicing here when we say the Lord's Supper. So I want to begin, number one, with the Lord's Supper, the Lord is referring to Jesus. I want you to look there in verse number 23. It says this, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So when we say the Lord's Supper, we're talking about Jesus' Supper. The Lord Jesus' Supper. The word Supper, I realize we're in the South and everyone should know this, but the word Supper means dinner. To prove that, Luke 14, 12 says, Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends. So what we're saying is the Lord Jesus' dinner, right? Or the Lord Jesus' supper. The Lord's supper. That's what we're referring to. We're going to look at another word or another phrase, nominational, that is used in place of this for the Lord's Supper. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. We're going to look at verse number 16. Well, oftentimes, as I did already, in this sermon, refer to it as communion. So it is the Lord's Supper, and it is also communion. Communion and the Lord's Supper, these terms are used <coughs> interchangeable. <coughs> interchangeably. So look there at 1 Corinthians 10, look at verse number 16. It says this, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So that right there is the reason why, <coughs> excuse me, we refer to it as Communion, And that, of course, means like fellowship. And I'm going to go greater into detail on that uh, in the future uh, of the sermon here. So now I want you to turn back over. Uh, <clears throat> actually, keep your hand here. I want to look one more time at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 16, that same verse. Secondly, we're going to see what is consumed. So it's a dinner. So the question is, what are we eating, right? What are we going to be consuming at this particular dinner? What's taking place? Look at the... <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 16. Unfortunately, this is a very important sermon. I have many, many notes for it, and of course I have to be uh, sick and not feeling well for this, but you're just going to have to bear with me. i got to put up with looking at your guys' faces every week, and you can put up with my voice this week, right? 1 First, First Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 16 says this, The cup of blessing which we bless, 
Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? So we see there's a cup. We see there's a drink that's here, right? It's unidentified at this point. We're going to get further into that in a moment. Then it says this, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So we see that, number one, there's a drink, there's a cup. Number two, there's bread. So the food is bread, but then there's a drink. Let's find out what that is. <clears throat> I want you to go over now with me to Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 26. So there's different uh, Gospels. Of course, we have the four Gospels. These are our four different records, different things that took place. They're all true, of course, but the different angles so we can learn different things from each Gospel. Here in Matthew chapter number 26, we see the record of the Lord's Supper. This is oftentimes, in, 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 uh, uh, to be more particular or specific, this is the Last Supper, right? This is the Lord's Supper. We saw that Paul referred to it as that, but this was the Last Supper that the Lord had with His disciples. That's why we'll call, call it as that. So look here in Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 26. The Bible says this, And as they were eating... Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So we saw that bread before, check. Now look at verse 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Now that's important, something to keep in mind when you take the Lord's Supper. When you are given the cup, you know what you need to do? What you're given, you need to drink all of it. So that's important. Keep that in your mind. I'm not going to touch on that again, but I will bring it up next week beforehand. Look at verse number 28 now. For this is my blood of the New Testament. So we see what it represents, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Look at verse 29. <clears throat> but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now see, we see, we can see from this, excuse me, that it is the fruit of the vine. He says, this fruit of the vine. Actually, the phrase is a little bit different in the other uh, gospel. just says, the fruit of the vine. So here it says, this fruit of the vine. What is that referring to? Very simple, right? It's referring to grape or grape juice. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but it's important because this is one of the most abused practices within churches. Now, when I say churches, I'm using that very loosely. A lot of these are not, of course, uh, even saved believers. So I'm speaking of Catholics. I'm speaking of all sorts of Protestants, even some Baptists. So I'm, what I am explaining to you today is the way in which we are going to practice or perform, administer, whatever word you want to use, the Lord's Supper. Now, <clears throat> some churches will use alcoholic wine, right, or grape juice. We here will not be using alcohol. We will be using uh, non-alcoholic grape juice. And I am going to show you from the Bible why. I'm going to show you very clearly what the Bible teaches. And what we see here is the fruit of the vine. That's what we start with. So we see that it is grape juice. Grape juice. I'm going to read to you from Leviticus 25.5 to, to prove to you that when the vine is referred to, it is referring to grapes or grape juice. <clears throat> Leviticus 25.5 says, That which groweth of its own accord... Of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. So notice the vine is referring to the grapes. Of course, grapes grow on the vine. It should be common sense. We're just be careful here. We're not going to leave any stones unturned. Isaiah 5, 2 again says, And he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. So notice, the choicest vine, a wine press, and it says this, And he looked at it, it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. So we at Value Baptist Church, we are going to be... Uh, of course, administering bread, we see, is going to be taking place at the Lord's Supper. And we're going to be giving out wine, which is grape juice. Now, the word wine is never used in regards to the Lord's Supper at all, period. Not one time. The only thing that you find is this fruit of the vine. Right after that, he says, I'm not going to drink. Well, what he says in that entire verse is, I'm not going to drink of this fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you my Father's kingdom. So we can see there also by comparing Scripture with Scripture that oftentimes we will see the phrase new wine used in the Bible, right? So that's another tip that tells us that he's speaking of wine. Now this is where the misunderstanding comes in, where maybe a lot of the Protestants get it wrong, or even some Baptists, is they don't understand that the word wine can be in the Bible alcoholic, and it can also be non-alcoholic. And I'm going to prove that to you very, very plainly. <clears throat> 
I have a lot of scriptures, so I'm going to be reading some of these to you, and then you'll be turning to more in just a moment. Lamentations chapter number 2, verse 11 and 12 says this. Mine eyes do fail with tears. Pay attention. My bowels are troubled. My liver is poured upon the earth for the destruction of the daughter of my people, because the children and the sucklings swoon in the streets of the cities. So the children and the sucklings, these are babies that are still nursing, and then young children. They say to their mothers, children and sucklings, where is corn and wine? When they swooned as the wounded in the streets of the city, when their soul was, and so forth and so forth. So the point is proven. I don't need to read the rest of that verse. You realize what the children and the sucklings are asking for? Corn and wine. Do you expect me to believe that a baby, that a child is asking for alcohol? Of course not. They're asking for juice. They want juice. You know why? Because all they have at this point is water. It's all they're able to drink during a famine. This is, of course, Jeremiah speaking of the hard times when uh, the Jerusalem was destroyed. They have nothing at this point, right? Isaiah 65, 8 says this, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster... And one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, and then so forth and so forth. So notice what it says. The new wine, <clears throat> excuse me, is found in the cluster. So what it's talking about is the juice within a grape while it's still attached to the cluster. And you know what the Bible calls it? Wine. Now, is it possible for there to be alcohol inside of that grape when it hasn't even been broken open? It's not, even, it's not even scientifically possible because the way that they did that with wine presses even at that time was to smash the grapes and there was a yeast-like substance that built up on the outside of it and that's what caused it to ferment. It's not even scientifically possible. But do you know what the Bible refers to the juice that is inside of that grape as? Wine. Marie knows that's not alcohol. Amen. Proverbs chapter number 23 verse number 31 says this. This proves there's two types of wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. When it giveth his color in the cup. This is the explanation of fermentation. The process of fermentation being described. When it moveth itself aright. So we can see there's two types of wine there very plainly. So we can see there's a change that's taking place. There's a time when you can look at the wine. And then there's a time when you should not even look at the wine. A lot of churches will practice the Lord's Supper, when they, are, uh, when they are practicing the Lord's Supper, they will hand out and give out to uh, the layman in the church, the people in the church, these are the, you know, the bishops, whatever you refer to them as, they'll give out to the layman alcohol. Now, I'm going to show you in just a moment that that is blasphemy. Because what, I want you to keep this in mind, what does the, the uh, wine actually is supposed to represent? This is not alcoholic, of course. What does it represent? The blood of Christ. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse number 32. Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse number 32. Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse number 32. This is also we're going to use uh, this particular, these two couple of verses actually we're going to read. It. We're going to kill two birds with one stone here. So Deuteronomy chapter number 32 and verse number 32. It says this. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. So notice their vine is different than our vine. That's the point. Look back at verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock. So what's the point? We both have a rock, but it's two different types of rocks, right? Verse 32 again. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes, watch this, are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Look at verse 33. Their wine is the poison of dragons. Notice how their rock is different than our rock. Their vine is different than our vine. Their wine is different than our wine. And what is it? Poison. You know what alcohol is? Poison. It's poison. This is what alcohol is you are consuming. Poison. That's what this is describing right here is alcohol. It's saying we did, what God is talking about is the children of Israel, they're not consuming alcohol. They're not consuming poison. But the people that he's referring to, they are. They are those other people are. We have a different type of rock than they have. We have a different type of vine than they have. We have a different type of wine than they have. This is true when you when you compare Baptist to Catholic as well. Not only that, something interesting is, you know what it said first there? Well, let me ask you this question. <clears throat> Who's the rock? Who's our rock? Jesus. You know what the Catholics say is their rock? Not Jesus. Peter. Look what it says in verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock. That's kind of weird, isn't it? I want you to look now at uh, Deuteronomy 32, 14. Look what else the Bible says here in this exact same chapter. 
Uh, let's look at verse 13 first. <laughs> He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Butter of kind, milk of sheep, with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats, with the fat of kidneys of wheat. Now watch, this is talking about Jacob, this is talking about Israel. Remember just a moment ago, Israel has a different type of wine than the heathen does, if you will. Look at what it says next. And thou didst drink the pure blood of the grave. So notice, the pure blood of the grave, and then what do you have over here? The poison of ass. It's a different type of wine, my friends. There's two different types of wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. There's two different types of wine. It's extremely clear. <clears throat> Matthew 26, 27, again, where we were before, Jesus said this, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That's the pure blood of the grave. That's why we don't drink alcohol here. We don't drink the poison of ass to rest, represent the Lord Jesus Christ's blood. We drink the pure blood of the grave. Amen. We're going to be Amen. passing out Welsh's grape juice is what we're going to be passing yes, out. Amen. Amen. I want you to go, to, uh, go back to Deuteronomy 32, 33. <clears throat> Actually, we'll skip that point. We'll go, go back to 1 Corinthians 11. We'll skip that. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. So we will not be drinking alcohol when we take the Lord's Supper. We're going to be drinking the pure blood of the grave. And we're going to be drinking, uh, we're going to be eating bread. Now, this goes hand in hand. The bread, we're going to be drinking, we're going to be drinking the pure blood of the grave. We're going to be drinking non-alcoholic grape juice. And then we're going to be eating bread. What type of bread? Unleavened, Unleavened bread. Now, you know what leaven is? It's a form of yeast. Do you know how you, you get, uh, uh, you, know, you know how you cause the bread to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to blow up? By putting leaven in it, which is the yeast. Do you know how you create alcohol? The yeast, like I mentioned before. So you see how it's supposed to be the pure blood of the grape, and it's supposed to be unleavened bread. Do you know why what it represents? represents the Lord, specifically his humanity, because of the fact that he died on the cross for us. It was his, his body that was that uh, experienced the death, his flesh, the bread, and then it was his blood that was spilled for us. And those things are pure. Why? Because he's sinless. That's Man. what it's supposed to represent. You know what, why it's blasphemous, specifically? Because whether people understand it or not, they are insinuating that Christ sinned. Right. What is, what is uh, uh, leaven represent in the Bible? Sin. You know why we have unleavened bread to represent Christ? Because he's sinless. That's right. You know why I have the pure blood of the grape? Because Christ is sinless. Because his blood is perfect and pure. It's the pure blood of the grape. That's right. So back here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And uh, Catholics also, not only will they serve you know, alcohol, but they have a teaching called transubstantiation. Where they say that this priest is literally turning the bread and the wine into literally the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then they're giving that to this person to consume. Now that's against the commandments of God. The Old Testament law, if there's a commandment given not to consume or eat flesh. So I don't have to give you anything more than that. In the book of Leviticus specifically, it tells you not to eat flesh. We're not allowed to eat flesh. And the reason why is because that the, the we're not allowed to eat blood. I'm sorry, I kept saying flesh. Blood. We're not allowed to eat blood. And it tells you that because the reason why is because the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So what takes place again, just to recap once more, after the Lord's Supper, we're going to be consuming the grape juice and the bread. Now, what I'm getting ready to go over with you right now is super, it's an extremely overlooked point of the Lord's Supper, but it's extremely interesting. <clears throat> Look at verse number 23 with me. This is where we get the title of the Lord's Supper. When we saw verse 21, I believe it was, verse 20, look at verse 20 first, I'm sorry to have you jumping around. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to get into the explanation of that verse later, but we can see in context what this is speaking about is the Lord's Supper. Let's skip down to verse 23. It's, of course, talking about the same thing. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he betrayed, took Bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So what is this called, what they did here, according to Paul? What was, what was Jesus doing? What did he refer to this as, this practice? 
the Lord's Supper, right? We call it communion, but right here in context, it's called the Lord's Supper. All right, I want you to go now back to uh, the book of Luke. I want you to go back to the book of Luke, chapter number 22. So uh, what I'm going to show you is actually found in the book of Luke to compare these passages with one another as, as far as the story being told in the book of Matthew, in the book of Mark, in the book of Luke. You're given a detail in the book of Luke that you're not given in any other gospels when they ate the Lord's Supper. I want you to look here at Luke chapter number 22, verse number 1. It says this, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Look down at verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Look at verse 8. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. Let's get down to verse 11. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Look at verse 13. <clears throat> And they went and found at, and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. I want you to look down again. Look at verse 15. And he said unto them, With desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you, <clears throat> excuse me, before I suffer. Now if we skip down, look at verse number 20. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament. In my blood, which is shed for you. Now, what did Paul say that this was? What did he refer to this as? The Lord's Supper. What does, in verse number 15, what does Jesus refer to this as? Passover. This is the Passover. So you know what that tells you? Just to begin with. So Paul said, hey, this is the Passover. And he was actually referring to when Jesus sat down amongst his disciples. It says in the same night, he took bread, right? So that's what Paul called the Passover. But then when you, I'm sorry, the, the Lord's Supper. But then when you go back and you actually read the account when Jesus is speaking about it, what does Jesus say that they're doing right at that moment? Passover. So you know what the Lord's Supper is? The Passover. But that means the Lord's Supper is the Passover. Now I'm going to give you more details on that right now. So, <clears throat> number one, just to give you the, the history about the Passover. Just to refresh your mind, I'm sure everyone here is probably somewhat at least familiar with this. Uh, Israel went down into Egypt. They were there for 430 years, I believe, to the day. They were brought out. And uh, God brought them out. But first he sent Moses down to tell Pharaoh, hey, let my people go. And he refused. Well, God said, hey, well, I'm going to be plaguing you. He sent plague after plague after plague until you let him go. He sent finally the what was the tenth plague which was what we refer to as the Passover. Now he told, to preface that, he told all the children of Israel, what I'm going to be doing is slaying the firstborn son in every house in the land of Egypt. Every single house of the firstborn son is going to die in the kingdom of Egypt. So in order for your firstborn not to die, what you have to do is you have to go get a lamb. And you have to kill that lamb. And you have to take the blood and strike it on the lentil and the side posts, right? Everyone's familiar with this? You strike on the lintel and the side post. And then when I send my angel, this is where we get the, the word Passover. When, my, when I send my angel, it's the death angel. And he passes over your house instead of killing your firstborn son. Because you killed that lamb in your son's place, I'm not going to kill your firstborn. My death angel, the angel is going to pass over you. And that's where we get the, the, the word uh, or title of that plague and of that story, Passover. And then what became a feast. So, that Pharaoh had had enough, right? When all the children die, I mean, can you imagine you know, what a catastrophe when all these families wake up and their firstborn son's dead? I mean, that's terrible, of course. And obviously, they, you know, if Pharaoh brought it upon himself, but that's it to put yourself in their shoes, that's sad. So, this was serious, is my point. Pharaoh wakes up, all the people wake up, and they're in a frantic and they're panicking. And Pharaoh says, Leave. In that very same day, they left. The very same day. And what they were to do was to celebrate a feast going forward forever, the Bible says. Forever. I want you to go to Exodus chapter number 12, verse number 14. They were to celebrate this feast, the Bible says very clearly, forever to commemorate the Passover. <clears throat> to remember the day that they were brought out of Egypt. <clears throat> Exodus chapter number 12, verse number 14. It says this, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial... 
and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. You know what that tells me? That there needs to be an ordinance today that's still continuing of the Passover. You know what it is? It's the Lord's Supper. That's what it is. Jesus called the Lord's Supper Passover. Now I want to give you a couple more details on this specific subject. Is That lamb, of course, represented Christ. Right? That lamb represented Christ. And there are so many different aspects of this. They had to take the lamb, and the lamb had to be spotless. They had to look at the lamb, and it had to be spotless. That represented Jesus being sinless. But not only that, on the tenth day, actually, they were supposed to take the lamb, and they were supposed to examine the lamb. Well, do you know what that represented was? Jesus being taken and put before Pilate, and he was examined. And you know what Pilate said? I find no fault in this man. It means he was spotless. It means he was the lamb that was ready to be given for the Passover, right? And then he was taken after that, and he was slain for it. And you know, like it says, it's interesting because you know this would be in this sense for um, when it took place in Egypt, <clears throat> it was for uh, Israel, right? Well, of course, he died for the sins of the whole world, but what also does it say uh, that his name is Jesus? Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. So when he was dying on the cross, he was like the lamb of the Passover for the nation of Israel in the same exact sense. Not only that, Jesus is referred to repeatedly as the firstborn. They had to take uh, the firstborn lamb, the first, the, the first fruits of the lamb, and that was specifically what it had to be. It had to be the best of the flock as well, a good one, right, that was taken and put in that place. So, we can see this perfectly. But you know what's interesting? When you go back and you read the Passover story of the Last Supper with Jesus and his disciples, they're sitting there. You know, there's unleavened bread mentioned. Now, what else did they do during the Passover? They had to have unleavened bread. You know that? It was the days of unleavened bread, like it said in Luke 22, 1, which is called the Passover. So, for seven days, they had to cook and make the unleavened bread, right? Prepare the unleavened bread. So, they had unleavened bread. We saw the wine. But in, in uh, uh, after the Last Supper, what's not mentioned? The lamb. There's no physical lamb that's mentioned or talked about that they ate. Do you know why? The lamb was there. That's right. Mm -hmm. It was Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me go back to Luke chapter number 22. <clears throat> Actually, go to Luke 22, and then I want you to get your other hand in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 7. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter number five, verse number seven. It says this purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you're unleavened. Now watch this. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. You know what, you know what uh, John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus in John, John, John chapter number one? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Yeah. So they had the unleavened bread, they had the wine. And they had the lamb. The lamb was there. And that's the whole purpose of the blood, which is to represent the new covenant. The lamb was, of course, of the law, it was the old covenant, but it pictured that the Lord Jesus Christ had come. So if you look there in Luke 20, 22, I want to read, excuse me, I want to read more through here just to give you knowledge of what takes place. So he says in verse number, uh, verse number 12, And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. When the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire of desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I said unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the wine, of the vine, I'm sorry, until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks, and brake it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 20. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. I want you to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 now. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. So the Lord's Supper is the reformed version of the Passover. It's a continuation of the Passover with just slight changes made to it. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, I want you to look down there, verse number 23. It says this, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, someone may ask the question, how often are we going to do the Lord's Supper? Some churches do it once a month. Some churches do it quarterly. Some churches do it, you know, uh, they'll do it uh, twice a year. We will be doing the Lord's Supper once a year. Because how long and how often did they do the Passover? Now, I'm not condemning any other churches. If other churches do it at different times, I, you know, that's up to them. But my point is this. If it's a continuation of the Passover, how often do they perform the Passover? Once a year. So how often you should do the Lord's Supper according to the Bible? According to that logic, once a year. So we'll be doing it once a year, uh, right around the time of Easter. Now, right here, some people will misunderstand this passage where it says, verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do shew the Lord's death till he come. Saying like, you can do it as often as you want. But that's not what it's saying. It's just saying when you do do it. For as often as you do it, he's saying, you, what you're doing when you do it, that's the point. You are showing the Lord's death until he comes. It's not saying just as often as you want to do it. That's not the point of the passage. <clears throat> now, I want to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 16. I want to hit on a small point that's going to be relevant to your understanding when you personally take up the Lord's Supper. Another thing that's referred to as we saw is communion. Now, what does communion mean? It means like fellowship, doesn't it? Look at verse number 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Verse 17. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. <clears throat> verse 18. Behold Israel after the flesh, are, they, are, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? So notice that that it refers to them as partakers, the people that are actually eating of the bread and drinking of the wine. They are partakers of that. Now, this is not in a literal sense like we're eating. His, Jesus wasn't standing there and he didn't literally start breaking his body apart when he started handing out the bread, right? Of course not. That's ridiculous. It's referring to salvation. If you go back and you look at you know, the debated scripture, I believe it's in uh, uh, John chapter number 6, I believe, is where people will try to say that that's where Jesus is saying you have to eat my blood or eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no life in you, that he means that literally. No, he, he clears it up. He tells them very, very plain the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, you know, they are life. So he's saying you have to figuratively eat of it. And you know what's funny is here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 at the very beginning of this, because Catholics will say that that's literal. But look at 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. This is not a coincidence that this is mentioned prior. It says, speaking of the children of Israel, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Is that literal? No, of course not. It's figurative. Why do you think it's mentioned right before we start talking about communion? Because it's another picture that's very similar to partaking in a picture of Christ. It just shows further that this is figurative. So one of the things that's, that I wanted to point out is that this is communion. So this is you having communion, in a sense, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because why? You are a partaker of salvation from Him. So, each family is going to decide when we do this, who they're going to give out you know, the bread to, who they're going to give out the wine to. So that's up to you, the heads of the household. I'll allow them to choose who they're going to give it to. But let me say this. If your children are not a partaker of Christ, if they're not saved and they're not old enough yet, then they should not be taken. Right. Now, we don't believe in closed communion. And I'll tell you why. Because Judas was there when they took part of the communion. Now, if Jesus believed in closed communion, don't you think he would say, hey, Judas, we got some business to do. Right? <laughs> right? So we do open communion. Judas wants to come and sit in the back. He can take part if he wants. That's fine. Jesus allowed him to. So whatever. We do open communion. Some Baptist churches uh, will be for closed communion. That's why I believe that that's not right. Because Judas was there. I mean, that's the epitome of the example of. And that's as open as of communion as you could possibly be, right? <laughs> So I'm tying that in with you choose. So Judas can choose, or whoever comes in. I'm not pointing to Brother Elf, right? <laughs> if whoever comes in, they can choose. You choose for your family. You know whether you're a partaker of Christ, and you are the one that decides, hey, I'm going to give this to my children, or I'm not going to give this to this child. I'm not sure about that. Right? But the point is that it's meant to be communion. 
you know, we have baptism and we have the Lord's Supper as two tangible things that the Lord gave us. These are tangible. This is supposed to be something we can touch. Jesus isn't here in front of us anymore. The disciples got to sit down with him face to face and literally have fellowship and communion with him. That's the point of this. So this is a moment where you get to take part in this. And you have something tangible just like the disciples had. And it's just an amazing thought, isn't it? We're like you're sitting there with Christ. And you get to have this communion with him. What's interesting is... The way in which we're able to have communion or fellowship with Christ is because He came down. God came down and was born on this earth as a man. He's, you know, called, he's referred to as God with us. So He dwelled in flesh and blood. It says that He was partakers of flesh and blood in Hebrews 2. He dwelled in flesh and blood. He was able to sit there and literally have this communion because He became a man. What does the bread represent? His body. His flesh. What does the blood represent? Yeah, or, I'm sorry, the wine represents the blood. Yeah, blood represents blood. You're right. The wine represents the blood, right? <laughs> Notice what it says in verse 17. For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. So saying we're all partakers of that one bread, saying we're all a part of, what's the bread? It's Jesus. What's the body referred to as oftentimes? The local church. You know, it's because he's what? A man. That's what it's referring to as. Christ is the head of the church. Why? Because he's a man. It's referring to his, his humanity. That's how we can have this communion with him. That's how the disciples were able to have it. So this needs to be, be a very serious moment when we hand out you know, uh, the, uh, the, the wine, which is you know, going to be Welch's grape juice. Of course, as I clarified, <clears throat> I don't know Welch's, but it's going to be great, the pure blood of the, of, the, of the grape, right? And it's going to be bread. This needs to be a serious moment for you where you are communing and you are you know, fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, 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 the purpose of this. Now I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. I'm going to deal with a couple of things real quick in closing here. 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to, I'm going to start in verse 19. One of the, I'm going to deal with two things. Number one, I'm going to deal with it. Just a very ridiculous interpretation that a lot of people here have heard. I'm going to show you how ridiculous it is, number one. Just so that everyone understands what this passage is teaching and that we should be taking communion here as a local church and not... You know, each individual. I don't believe that each person at home needs to be, you know, just individually, and you're not supposed to take it to church. And I'll show you why and all that. And then the other thing I'm, I'm going to get to is the warnings about taking the Lord's Supper lightly and not being prepared and examining yourself first. Let's look at verse number 19 in 1 Corinthians 11. It says, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, the interpretation of this verse that I've heard is saying that when you come together, basically what this person is saying is it should be to eat the Lord's Supper. That's what I've heard, you know, the interpretation of this passage. Like, the, when you come together, the reason should not be to eat the Lord's Supper. And this is, a, of course, a proponent of, of, of the view that's saying you should not be coming together and having the Lord's Supper. But that's not what this is teaching He's saying that their purpose into coming together, or their reason that they're coming together, was not to eat the Lord's Supper. They had bad intentions when they came, and I'll prove that to you. What does the word for mean in the Bible? Because. because. Okay, look at verse 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other, before other his own supper. And, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. You know what he's explaining? He's saying that when you come together yourself, you're not coming together for the purpose of eating the Lord's Supper. Do you know how I know that? Because one person is eating at home already and then coming. You know, and then another person's coming and he's, he's, uh, he's hungry. He hasn't eaten anything. So you know what he's doing? He's coming there and he's just like, like eating all the bread and drinking all of the juice. Say he's abusing it. He's not taking it seriously. It's not for the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is not something that... Don't come here and expect, like, hey, honey, we're, we're skipping dinner tonight. We're going to have the Lord's Supper. That's what he's explaining right now. It's not meant to be a meal for you. It's meant to be something of communion and fellowship between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not meant to just, you know, just satisfy your hunger. That's what, and that's what he's saying here is, when ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now he's going to explain how he knows that when they were coming together, their intentions weren't to eat the Lord's Supper. For there must, and I'm sorry, for in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another drunken. 
So another person is just like totally full to the point where he can't even eat anything. So he doesn't even want to eat anything, the bread or anything, the Lord's Supper. And then the other person is starving, so he's coming there to like fill himself up. Do you understand how they're looking at this as like an actual meal, both of them? <clears throat> Look at verse 22. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? That's not talking about the Lord's Supper. That's talking about the people that were abusing the Lord's Supper to eat and drink. And he's saying, don't come to the congregation and expect to eat and to drink. Come here to take the Lord's Supper. These are two different things. So he's saying, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Don't come here and expect to eat and drink. Like I just said a moment ago, don't tell your wife we're skipping dinner. Let's, we're going to be eating and drinking at you know church and, and, and having a feast. That's not the point. So that's what he's explaining. And to drink it or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And then he goes on. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he, he was betrayed took bread. We're going to keep reading down through and the other thing I'm going to hit on. Again. Um, verse, where did I leave off? Verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This you do in remembrance of me. That's one other thing is I'm gonna I'm going to have a piece of bread. I'm gonna break a piece of bread into different pieces. You know, sometimes people will, have, will like cook all of the pieces or get like cut up pieces where they're already cut up. Well the whole point is I believe to see it broken. Because Jesus broke it in front of them and then he distributed it to them because it was meant to re to represent the breaking was his flesh being you know uh, killed for us, right? And then <clears throat> I want you to look at, uh, keep reading there in verse number um, 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So this is where we're beginning the warnings. So pay close attention. I'll read that verse one more time. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, that's a strong statement. So if I were you, I'd listen very closely to these next couple of verses. Look at verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So God wants you to take part in it, but there's something you've got to do first. What is it? Examine yourself. Verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Not discerning. What does it mean, discerning? Like thinking about, understanding. Discerning referring to the mind, thoughts, right? Discerning the Lord's body. So what does it represent? One more time. The Lord's death. And the purpose of it is to remember in remembrance. Jesus said to do it in remembrance of me. It says that you are showing the Lord's death till he comes. Now, can you imagine a person living in just a terrible, open sense? Something, I'll use an extreme example, adultery. And then they come into church real flippantly, it's the Lord's Supper, and they just sit down. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for how many of your sins? All of them. Every last one of them, right? Even the ones you're still committing. Right? So can you imagine a person just living in this open sin, with no desire to get out of sin, no care in the world, and they just come in here and, hey, here's the Lord's Supper. You're given the body and the blood of Jesus, figuratively, of course. What does it represent? What was spilled and what happened for him? And then he's living in this open sin. He has no regard for it. And he's just like, bam, bam. Just a, 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 a complete irreverent system. For what? For the death that he had to pay for you. It's supposed to represent the death of his flesh and his blood that he spilled because of your sin. And then you think that you're going to come to church in this open sin, living in this horribly great wickedness, and nothing's going to happen about it? Yeah, I know this is the Lord's death. And you just and all that's done for those sins that you are committing, and you just keep doing it and keep living in it. There's a warning about that. And look how serious it is. Now, these types of warnings are only given a couple. I, I can only think of one other place where like a big, serious warning like this is given to a Christian. And it's in the book of Hebrews. Look at what it says next. <clears throat> Verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you. And then it says this. And many sleep. You know what that means? That means sleep in the Bible means dead. So that means that if you are living in some major open sin and you just don't examine yourself, you come to church, you take part in the Lord's Supper, 
You know what one of the one of the possible punishments to that is? Because Paul's saying, even within their church, they probably had a fairly large church in the, church, the cities of Corinth, but even still, even people within their church had died because they flippantly took part of the Lord's Supper, just being irreverent when they had a major sin in their life. God killed them. Now, that's why the, that's the whole reason why this sermon is being preached a week ahead of time. I'm not saying anybody's here living in some major sin, but any sin that you have in your life, whatever's going on in your life, you need to take this as a very serious opportunity for the next week to try to clean that up. Amen. You need to take this for, you know, this this particular warning from 1 Corinthians. Who, I'm the preacher of what this word says. So if you take me serious, I don't care. You know, what you need to be taken serious is God's warning here in verse number 30. Many sleep. That's what the Bible says. Many, many are sick. Many are weak. Right? These are possible punishments for you if you want to keep living in this sin. You come here and just take part of the Lord's Supper knowing that's what He did for you. But then you continue to live that type of lifestyle. And you're not going to lose your salvation. And that's one of the great things you can teach from this. Look at verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, it says this, we are chastened of the Lord. Notice what it says next that we should not be condemned with the world. So notice that, that the whole reason why we're chastened of the Lord is because we're not going to be condemned with the world. The world's going to go to hell. You're going to get weak, weak and sick and then die but when you die. If you're a saved believer, if you believe in Christ, even if you got into wickedness, you're going to go to hell. That's right. See, the Bible's real clear in eternal security. It's not a question. It's very, very clear in the Bible. So that's why I use the word chastened. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, talking about for as many as the Lord loves, right? As many as the Lord loves, he... he uh, no, I'm sorry, I was quoting Revelation. It says he rebukes and chastened. Well, how's that verse start out? I quote it every week when I go soul winning. Now all of a sudden, I, I mess myself up, so I quote it a different verse. Many people have Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so uh, for as many... Yeah, it's something like that, right? So he, he rebukes and he chastens his children. He punishes his children. Right? He's chastening, that's a, a word of discipline. Right? So he's not chastening the world. He's not punishing those that are not his children. Because when they die, they're going to go to hell. But he's going to punish you and he's going to chase you. So this is a very serious warning that we should take. Give me the first word. For whom? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son in me receiveth. I threw myself off of that first word. Yeah, so for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son in me receiveth. So every son he receives... He punishes his children because we're all sinners. Because he loves us. That's why he's chasing these people so that they would not be condemned in the world. Right. And they're not going to go to hell. But who wants to, you know, the majority of people in here are under 35, right? Who wants, who wants to go ahead and end their life now? Nobody at any age wants to, right? If you could speak to Saul who lived longer, lived a disobedient life, but died by the hands of God, if you will. Because of his disobedience, he went to heaven, but do you think he was satisfied the way his life ended on this earth? No. Not a chance. Not a chance. Who wants to die a life like that? Who wants to live and end their life that way? Right? right? But even still, even if you have a small sin and it's possible you're weak and sickly, don't start conjuring up if that's the reason why I'm sick either. <laughs> but who wants to be sick? Who wants to be living in sin and bringing punishments and affliction and upon himself? No one. Of course not. Hey, this is a real opportunity, a very serious opportunity to clean your life up for the next week. Examine yourselves and be prepared when you come in here. That's the Lord's body and blood that you're about to eat. Figuratively, of course, but you're about to take that. That's serious, man. That's very, very, very serious. There's nothing more precious than that. And you're about to take part in that. You better make sure that you're as clean as you've ever been. Amen. Keep reading here. Verse number 32, we're going to end. We're going to read that one more time. We'll read the rest of these verses. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, watch this, when ye come together to eat, carry one for another. So notice now he says, when ye come together to eat, carry one for another. What's he saying? That you do come together to eat the Lord's Supper, but not to, not to actually take part in the meal. So now he's telling them to come together to eat in the sense of eating the Lord's Supper, not consuming a meal. Don't come to church hungry, right? And don't come to church just like, 
Like the Bible says, drunk in there where you're just like so full you just like can't have anything else. That's what drunken means, right? You just can't even, you can't even bear to look at a piece of bread. And that's not right either, right? Look at what it says in verse 34. And if any man hunger, <laughs> let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. Do you notice what he just taught too there? If any man does hunger, just let him, let him eat at home beforehand so that he doesn't come, that we don't come together when we eat the Lord's Supper to condemnation. So verse number 34 is as clear as day that you are supposed to be eating the Lord's Supper together. Everyone is supposed to be taking part in it. It's not something you do in your homes, it's your houses. When you come together, if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come to get that you come not together into condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. The fire has to have a word for it. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, uh, for our Passover. We thank you for the Lord.